The captain major of the Portuguese fleet climbed to the bridge of his flagship. The scene before him was gruesome. His armada had established naval superiority over the harbor of the Indian city of Calicut. All around him were the destroyed, broken remains of a Muslim fleet. Hundreds of dead bodies still drifted in the water. Some of the ships, that is, the ones that the Portuguese had not sent to the bottom of the harbor, were still burning, billowing smoke into the humid air of the Malabar coast. Not far away was a trading outpost that Portugal had just established. Now, it was nothing more than a shattered ruin. Two nights before, an overwhelming Muslim force had attacked it, burned it to the ground, and killed nearly everyone inside. Diplomacy had obviously failed. Now there was only a sense of vengeance that was left. Meanwhile, during these two critical days, the Hindu king of Calicut had not sent a message indicating that he had either supported or, more importantly, denounced the attack on the outpost. His royal silence for the men of Portugal implied that he was guilty of conspiring with the Muslims, and thus he too would be held accountable. The Captain Major was a man by the name of Pedro Alvarez Cabral. He had his fleet towed by longboats as close to the city as the shallow waters of the harbor would allow. While the Portuguese ships were being brought in, a vast portion of the population of the city had come out to the beach. They had come out to retrieve the bodies of those that were killed and to behold this large fleet that had come to anchor so close to them. The people of Calicut, men, women, and children, watched with surprise as a line of innumerable cannons were brought to bear on all of the ships. The city of Calicut was targeted. The immense crowd just happened to be in the line of sight. Cabral waited for a moment. He wanted to see the sun begin to climb in the eastern sky. Then, turning slowly to his men, he gave a single order. He shouted the words, Open fire! The command echoed down the line for all of his men to hear. They knew at that moment that there would be no turning back. Gaspar da Gama was dressed in a regal white linen shirt. It had become essentially his trademark. It did, after all, complement his other fine clothing, which was needed as he was on his way to see the King of Portugal. He was an intellectually refined man who commanded incredible charisma. He also happened to speak at least a dozen languages, including Latin, Castilian, Portuguese, Arabic, Italian, and several dialects of southern India. In time, he'd also pick up a little Swahili. His knowledge of the Indian Ocean made him invaluable as the ideal diplomat and guide, not to mention also being a great interpreter. Over the years, he had gained an impressive survival trait, that is, having the ability to charm just about anyone. At the same time, he carried about him this aura of being enigmatic and mysterious. No one really knew where he was originally from. He said he was born of Jewish parents in the Kingdom of Poland, circa 1444-ish, but others were convinced that he was from Bosnia, Grenada, or perhaps even Alexandria. It was said that he had fled Europe to escape religious persecution, then converted to Islam, and in time had come into the good graces of the Sultan of Goa, who he then served as an ambassador. How this happened, no one really knows for sure. The story he gave seemed to keep changing. What is known with more certainty is that Gaspar met Vasco da Gama, the first European to discover the sea passage to India, on his return trip from Calicut in 1498. At that time, Gaspar had been dispatched by the Sultan of Goa to lure the Portuguese fleet into a trap, but he was discovered, taken prisoner, beaten up a bit, converted to Christianity, unleashed his charm, and thus managed to befriend and then accompany Vasco da Gama all 12,000 miles back to Portugal. Nigel Cliff, in his book The Last Crusade, speaks of how he got his name. Quote, He took the name Gaspar after one of the three eastern kings who had followed the Star of Bethlehem, and da Gama after his captor, torturer, interrogator, and now godfather. End quote. Gaspar immediately became one of King Manuel's favorites. The sovereign of Portugal would often take his counsel. Now, it needs to be said that King Manuel was 
firmly convinced that the inhabitants of India were Christian. Indeed, part of the reason why the Portuguese king had spent so much money on his expeditions was an attempt to reach out to the, quote, Christian kings of India to have them join the West in their ongoing crusades against Islam. Gaspar da Gama knew that in reality there weren't that many Christians in the East at all. But the man also wanted to survive and keep his head. So when he arrived in the king's presence and was asked about the status of Christian rulers in the subcontinent, he responded by saying that there were 14 Indian states, of which 12 were Christian, mainly the larger ones, who together could field an army of, oh, I don't know, 223,000 foot soldiers, at least 15,000 cavalry, and 12,400 war elephants, who each carried a dozen men in a wooden castle on their backs, and charged their enemies with five swords attached to their tusks. King Manuel was blown away. With that kind of firepower and the wealth of the spice trade, Islam wouldn't stand a chance. The king was overjoyed with this news, and thus he personally brought Gaspar to see the vast new armada that he had built. Whereas before Vasco da Gama was dispatched with four ships and approximately 170 men, now there would be 13 ships and 1,500 men, of which 600 were soldiers. On board was the best nautical equipment, ravished gifts for the kings of India, and some of the finest sailors that Portugal could produce. The entire enterprise was backed up not only by royal funds, but also by investors from Florence and surprisingly Genoa who had turned from competitor to collaborator. But the most important thing the Armada carried was knowledge. The departure time was now dictated by the rhythm of the monsoons, not by the estimates of the royal astrologers. The sea route would be based on the circular winds of the South Atlantic, which had been proven effective by the prior voyages of Bartholomew Diaz and Vasco da Gama. Leading the ships were experienced men like Pedro Escobar and Nicolas Coelho, who had journeyed with Vasco da Gama and had seen India. Indeed, even Bartholomew Diaz, the first European to round the tip of Africa, and his brother Diogo Diaz had joined the venture. Of course, Gaspar da Gama, with his knowledge and experience, would also be coming along. Now all that was left was to find someone capable to run the entire show. The man chosen as leader of the expedition was Pedro Álvarez Cabral. He was a fidalgo, that is, a person of noble birth. He was born in 1467 in Belmonte, Portugal and became a member of the royal court, where he obtained an excellent education. By 1497, he was anointed as a Knight of the Order of Christ. On one end, he was considered to be generous, prudent, and tolerant. On the other, he was also deemed to be vain and would react with aggression if his honor was at stake. This was a man who was not afraid to use violence. Cabral was not a sailor. He was chosen for his status as a nobleman and the fact that he had been groomed to be a diplomat. King Manuel had given him a set of instructions on how he should approach the King of Calicut, who again everyone in Portugal still figured was a Christian. Nigel Cliff in The Last Crusade elaborates on these royal orders, quote, Cabral was to convey a message in private. He was to request that the king of Calicut, known as the Zamorin, was to simply banish every Muslim from his harbors. The Portuguese would henceforth supply the commodities that the Arabs had brought only better and cheaper. King Manuel gave his commander a final top secret order. If the Zamorin didn't quietly consent to trade solely with the Portuguese, Cabral should make cruel war upon him for his injurious conduct to Vasco da Gama. The Zamorin, again the King of Calicut, might have been a fellow Christian, but he was clearly misguided, and King Manuel was in a hurry. Cabral's orders also instructed him to establish relations with the other Christian states of India and to do all he could to interfere with Muslim shipping. End quote. The Armada of 13 ships departed from Balim on March 9, 1500. After a royal celebration, the king personally accompanied the sailors to the shore. From Portugal, they made a direct course for the Cape Verde Islands, but ominously along the way, in fair weather, one of the ships disappeared with all hands, never to be seen again. Just beyond the Cape Verde Islands, using the knowledge of his predecessors, Cabral then directed his ships to head southwest. Thus, he wanted to begin the counterclockwise looping maneuver of the South Atlantic to hopefully land them beyond the Cape of Good Hope. 
but departing at this latitude, the looping maneuver that he would employ would be much bigger. On April 21st, 1500, several days into the southwest bearing, an unknown land was unexpectedly spotted. A chronicler described it as a large mountain, very high and round, with lowlands to the south, and flatlands with great groves of trees. As they approached, they soon discovered that it was inhabited. Nicholas Coelho was dispatched to make first contact. Roger Crowley in the book The Conquerors described the scene, quote, this landfall proved to be as peaceful as it was unexpected. The naked inhabitants were vividly different from the tribes that were encountered on the shores of Africa. The people appeared to be docile. They danced the Portuguese bagpipe music and were willing to mimic the actions of the mass performed on the tropic shore. This place, which they christened the land of the true cross, had plentiful water and fruit and strange animals. They ate the flesh of the manatee, which they described as being as large as a barrel with a head like that of a pig and small eyes. They saw brilliantly colored parrots, some as large as hens. A ship was immediately dispatched to sail back to Portugal with news for King Manuel of this new land that they had just discovered and claimed for the crown." End quote. Unknown to Pedro Cabral and his men at the time, this was not a large island, but rather the continent of South America, and the land that they had arrived at would one day be known as Brazil. For several days, the Armada took in provisions, made repairs, and conducted the first mass on the continent. On May 2nd, 1500, the voyage continued. After 10 days of sailing, a comet was seen in the sky. It was described as having a very long tail in the direction of Arabia. It would serve as an ominous sign. 12 days later, on May 24th, Cabral's fleet entered the high-pressure zone of the South Atlantic. A strong wind pushed them east, but near the Cape of Good Hope, the Armada sailed directly into a fierce storm. It came on so suddenly that no one was prepared. In the fury of the tempest, four ships were lost, including the Carrack that carried Bartholomew Diaz. He was never seen again, and ironically, he died at the Cape that he had discovered. After some time, the remaining seven ships moved up the eastern coast of Africa and managed to reassemble on June 20th off the coast of Mozambique. But shortly thereafter, Diogo Diaz and his ship got separated from the Armada, drifting off to the east. For several days, he attempted to find his countrymen, but instead, he stumbled into a large island. Diogo Diaz would go down in history as the first Portuguese explorer to set eyes on Madagascar. Diogo continued north in an attempt to find the Armada. He would sail past the Horn of Africa and into the Gulf of Aden, which was another place that no Portuguese had ever sailed. Here, he was trapped by the winds and attacked by pirates. Thirst and starvation reduced his crew to a fraction of their original number. With these losses, Diogo was forced to give up the chase. He turned south, limped away, and eventually made the vast, long journey back to Lisbon. Meanwhile, Cabral and the remaining six ships made their way along the African coast. The Sultan of Mozambique would give them a cold reception. His city was, after all, still rebuilding from Vasco da Gama's attack two years prior. From here, they carried on to discover the port of Kilwa in modern-day Tanzania. It was a major trading hub, and here they took on provisions. Mombasa was skipped entirely. It wasn't until they arrived at Malindi on August 2nd that they got a somewhat lukewarm reception. Now, curiously enough, a chronicler mentioned at that time that scurvy was beginning, but he also noted that those who ate oranges and other fruits made the sickness abate, which was a pretty impressive insight. From Malindi, they crossed the Indian Ocean with a strong wind at their back, a lesson that they had learned from the voyage of Vasco da Gama. The trip across was relatively quick and uneventful. Cabral made landfall at Anjadiva Island in midsummer, which was known as a place to take on water. Here they waited for two weeks to ambush Muslim shipping coming in from Arabia, but when none showed up, it was time to move on. On September 13, 1500, the Portuguese Armada arrived at Calicut. By now, the old Samudri, who Vasco da Gama had met, had passed on. He was replaced by his nephew, a younger Samudri, who was much more eager to engage in trade. 
Despite this, negotiations were erratic and strained. But once both sides had arrived at the negotiating table, Cabral jumped into action. He presented the King of Calicut his letter of introduction from King Manuel, along with extremely lavish gifts of gold and silver. However, he also gave his list of demands. Now you gotta keep in mind that from the Portuguese perspective, they had been appointed by the Pope to come to the Indian Ocean to firmly establish trade, gain allies, and wage holy war against Islam. Cabral thus demanded restitution of goods that Vasco da Gama had left behind, a low cost to all spices, a secure trading outpost in Calicut, preferential tax tariffs, and that all Muslims were to be banished. An exceedingly tall, if not impossible, order. To top it all off, the Portuguese also insisted that they were to be unhindered as they attacked Arab shipping. It took two and a half months of negotiations that were tainted with aggressive stances and confrontational posturing to secure some of these mandates. But eventually it worked out. In time, a Portuguese trading outpost went up in the city, being built into a series of houses that lined the waterfront. Despite this success, Pedro Cabral was not satisfied. He knew that something sinister was in the works. The negotiations between the Portuguese and the Samudri were done with Muslim intermediary translators. This was a major breach in security. Any transaction, any conversation would be readily known to the Muslim traders of the city. Cabral knew that they could not be trusted. He feared that his Islamic competitors were busy poisoning the mind of the King of Calicut against him. What made it even more suspicious was that after three months at port, only two of his ships had been filled with spice. Something must have been obstructing the process. In that same time, Arab traders had come and gone with their cargo holds full. Cabral bitterly complained to the Zamorin, who at this point was caught between two rival factions that were growing more hostile towards one another by the day. Finally, in December of 1500, the King of Calicut grudgingly acquiesced to the Portuguese demand to hunt down Muslim shipping on the high seas. Cabral now had his green light. He simply waited for an opportunity. It just so happened that a few days later, a rich Muslim merchant ship destined for the port of Jeddah departed. The Portuguese armada raced in. They captured the vessel, took its cargo, and killed most of the crew. That building hostility that had been reaching a breaking point between Christian and Muslim was now ready to explode. In the book, The Conquerors, Crowley recounts the Muslim response. Quote, a mob began to gather in the city streets. Together, they moved towards the Portuguese trading outpost. There were about 70 men from the ships in the town armed with swords and shields trying to resist the attack against the mob, who were described as being innumerable. The Portuguese were forced back inside the building, which was surrounded by a wall as tall as a man on horseback. They managed to shut the outer gate. From the wall, they fired crossbows, killing a fair number of people. From the building's roof, they hoisted a banner as a distress signal to the ships. Cabral dispatched longboats armed with swivel guns to disperse the crowd. This had no effect. The Muslim crowd began to destroy the outer wall so that in the space of an hour, they raised it completely. The defenders were now penned inside, shooting from the windows. The commander decided that further resistance was useless. Their best hope was to make a break for the shore. Bursting out of the house, most of them managed to reach the beach. To their dismay, the boats were holding back, not daring to approach in rough sea. The armed mob closed in. Despite there being just a few survivors, most of the men of Portugal that night were hacked to pieces. End quote. Cabral and his men watched as their outpost was reduced to cinders and their countrymen were slaughtered right in front of them. A day went by awaiting a response from the King of Calicut about the attack. The Zamorin had no idea how to respond that would be equitable to both sides. He opted to say nothing. Thus, it was time for Portugal to respond. Cabral unleashed his armada on the 10 Muslim ships in the harbor of Calicut. He may have been outnumbered, but that day, Portuguese cannon reigned supreme. Some of the ships were taken, their crews were executed, and their bodies were thrown into the water. The ships that attempted to escape were reduced to burning driftwood by Portuguese gunfire. 
The people of Calicut could only watch on with horror at the unfolding carnage before them. The fighting continued well into the night, and yet there was still no response from the Zamorin. For Cabral and his men, this only meant that the Samudri was a Muslim agent, and thus he too would need to be taught a lesson. The very next morning, the Portuguese ships were towed as close to the city as their longboats would allow. Every cannon was brought to bear on the city. Meanwhile, a massive crowd had gathered on the beaches to salvage what they could. They were positioned directly in front of the ships. Cabral then gave the order to fire, and what followed was a momentous fleet-wide broadside that pummeled everything before it. Nigel Cliff in The Last Crusade describes the scene, quote, Cannonballs plowed into the crowds on the seafront and tore through houses and temples, killing hundreds, if not thousands. So great was the consternation that the Zamorin fled from his palace, and one of his chief Nayars, who was standing next to him, was killed by a ball. Even part of the palace was destroyed by the cannonade." End quote. The bombardment of Calicut would continue for an entire day. Relations had now reached terminal collapse, a point beyond forgiveness. This would be the first major flashpoint of a very long war. The next morning, wanting to cut his losses, Cabral decided to sail off. At the advice of Gaspar de Gama, the Armada headed to the city of Cochin, about 100 miles to the south. Cochin had been a vassal to the Samudri and was eager to establish Portuguese relations, if for no other reason than to free itself from Calicut rule. Here, Cabral and his men stayed for two weeks, filling some of their ships with spice and establishing a Portuguese outpost. By now, news of the attack on Calicut had spread along the entire Malabar coast, and other cities like Kolam and Konur also sent in their delegates to establish contact. The Portuguese presence was clearly now a disruptive factor in the politics of the Indian Ocean. It was at this point that Cabral's mind was opened. Meeting so many of the local powers, it dawned on the Portuguese that there were not that many Christians in India after all. They were finally able to understand the existence of Hinduism and just how ubiquitous it was. This revelation was a bit shocking. Meanwhile, the Samudri was planning his revenge and had assembled a fleet of 80 ships to intercept Cabral on his return. However, when the two fleets met, nothing happened. The king's men, at this point, were too wary of Portuguese firepower and kept their distance. Cabral, meanwhile, was heavily loaded with spice. He simply ignored the threat and made his way past them to the port of Canor. The king of Canor was more than enthusiastic to welcome in the Europeans and provided them a good deal on more spice. For Cabral and his armada, it was now time to make the journey home. Using the winds of the monsoon to their favor, they crossed the Indian Ocean with relative ease. This was a far cry from the devastating journey that Vasco da Gama had made just a few years prior. When they arrived at Malindi, a navigational error grounded one of the ships that was loaded with spice. It caught on fire, and nearly everything on board was destroyed. Continuing on the journey, the Armada spotted the port of Sofala, which was the hub of the West African gold trade. It would later serve as a major port for Portugal. At the Bay of St. Brás, near the Cape of Good Hope, Cabral left a message for any other Portuguese fleets in a shoe that hung from a tree, indicating the situation in India. It was in June of 1501, at the Bay of Dakar in modern-day Senegal, that Diogo Diaz was found. His ship was quickly brought back into the fold. Cabral's armada arrived back in Lisbon in the summer of 1501, but only in piecemeal. It had been scattered repeatedly on the last leg of the voyage. When he saw his returning ships, King Manuel had very mixed feelings. On one end, he was horrified. Nigel Cliff explains why. Quote, Europe's horizons were expanding at a bafflingly fast rate, but Cabral would not reap the glory. He had found no Christian allies, and he had not made a single convert. He had lost hundreds of experienced sailors and half his fleet. Of the 13 ships that had left Lisbon, only seven returned, of which only five carried any spice. He had let the merchants of Calicut destroy the Portuguese factory. 
And though he had exacted bloody revenge, he had failed to stamp out the rebellion. All told, he had not been bold or successful enough for his king's liking. It was a harsh judgment on a man who had been set an impossible task. But regardless, Cabral would spend the rest of his life in disgrace. End quote. King Manuel was undeterred. He put the best spin on this that he could. Pedro Alvarez Cabral was the first to take credit to stand on four continents. From a Portuguese perspective, his voyage had discovered South America, Madagascar, the opening of the Red Sea, and the ports of Kilwa and Safala. He proved that he could use the monsoons for his benefit, and the spices that he brought back sold for 800% profit, which not only paid for everything, but it also horrified the Venetians. But perhaps most importantly, Cabral's voyage made the King of Portugal realize the gravity of the situation. That is, there were very few Christians in India, and the spice trade was commanded by a Muslim monopoly. King Manuel decided then and there that the only solution to establishing a firm presence in India was the use of overwhelming strength. He would claw his way in. By then, a new and much more powerful armada had already been built. It was even bigger, 20 ships, 1,800 men, and all of it armed to the teeth. To some, it was even called the Revenge Fleet. All that was left was to put it in the hands of someone who was not afraid to use its destructive potential. Someone who already held a grudge. Someone who wanted vengeance. The man appointed to the task was a veteran. It was now time for Vasco da Gama to set sail again and unleash his dark side. It was a calm day on the broad expanse of the Indian Ocean. Drifting on the water was a large Muslim transport ship known as the Miri. On board were over 300 men, women, and children. Of the latter, some were merely infants. They were returning from Mecca on Hajj, that is, on pilgrimage, but now their ship was dead in the water. The masts were destroyed, the weapons had been confiscated, and some of the cargo had already been plundered. What's more, the rudder had been literally stripped from the hull. Circling the disabled vessel was not just a fleet, but an armada of Portuguese vessels, all bristling with weaponry. The wealthy merchants on board the Miri had initially surrendered without a fight. They were, after all, used to negotiating their way out of issues like this with the local pirates. However, the overall commander of the armada was Vasco da Gama, a man who had returned to the Indian Ocean to unleash vengeance, which was now at a fever pitch. The once explorer, now promoted to the rank of admiral, had refused every lucrative offer that came his way and had declined all forms of diplomacy. He passively watched as the women on the stricken vessel held up their children and pleaded for mercy. But in the end, his final solution was to set the ship on fire and let it burn with everyone on board. Tome Lopez, a chronicler and eyewitness of the event, was horrified with what he saw. Nigel Cliff, in his book, The Last Crusade, surmises his thoughts well. Quote, Tome Lopez was stunned, shocked by the Admiral's refusal to relent and amazed that he was willing to turn down such wealthy offers. There was no doubt in his mind that the ransom would have been enough to buy the freedom of every Christian prisoner in Morocco. Yet despite his misgivings, there were plenty of zealous Christians among the crews who had no more qualms than their crusader forebears about killing peaceful merchants and pilgrims. The dehumanizing notion that their enemies in faith were somehow not real people was too deeply ingrained. Like holy warriors before and after, they avoided looking into their victims' eyes and got on with their godly business." End quote. With a nod from Vasco da Gama, Portuguese engineers came on board the Miri. They systematically locked all the people of the ship in the holds, then set incendiary charges and quickly exited the scene. The people on board the Miri were now left to watch with terror as the flames that surrounded them began to rise.
King Manuel I of Portugal was convinced that a new approach was needed if the great markets of spice far to the east were to be his. In a prior voyage, Pedro Alvarez Cabral had been dispatched to India, but he had suffered tremendous losses, and in the eyes of the king, his mission had failed. The sovereign had decided that diplomacy was over, aggression was now needed, and thus a new armada had been created. In all, there were now 20 ships, many of which were larger and more powerful than anything that the Portuguese had fielded. On board were experienced men who knew how to not only sail, but more importantly, how to wage war. King Manuel wanted the commander of this vast new armada to be someone who was willing to show Portugal's ferocity to the world. The commander he appointed was a veteran who had been nursing a grudge for a long time, a man whose anger had reached a boiling point. He was someone who would be willing to dish out some major payback. Now, neighboring Castile at this point had made Christopher Columbus their admiral of the ocean sea. Not wanting to be outdone, Manuel granted his new commander, Vasco de Gama, the title Admiral of India. The title, by the way, was a political jab. Gama, after all, had made it to India, whereas Columbus had not. The 20 ships of what would be known as the 4th Portuguese Armada was divided into three squadrons. Vasco da Gama would command the first squadron, which consisted of 10 ships from his flagship, the São Geronimo, which was a large carac. Vasco's maternal uncle, Vicente Sodre, now a vice admiral, would lead the second squadron, which was made up of five ships. This second squadron, by the way, also had Brash Sodre, another uncle, Alvaro de Atied, who was a son-in-law, and Gaspar da Gama, who was a very unlikely godson. The third and final squadron, which was still under construction, consisted of five more vessels and would be under the stern eye of Estevong de Gama, Vasco's first cousin. Estevong's flagship, by the way, the mighty Flor de la Mar, was destined to become one of the most famous ships in Portuguese history. For all to see, this was going to be more than just an affair for king and country. For Vasco, this was a family business, and his goal was to give the Samudri Raja of Calicut a deal he couldn't refuse. Now, it needs to be mentioned that not all the chroniclers on this voyage give the same story. There is some degree of ambiguity to what actually happened. What is known for certain is that the first contingent of 15 ships, consisting of Vasco de Gama and his uncle Vicente Sodre's squadrons, left Lisbon on February 10, 1502. Estevang de Gama and his five ships left two months later after construction had been completed on April 1st. The two fleets would not rendezvous again until they both reached the Indian Ocean. As before, the main fleet made its way to the Cape Verde Islands. By some accounts, landfall was also made in late February at the Bay of Dakar. From here, they would turn to the southwest, and on March 6th, they began the counterclockwise curving South Atlantic run. The men would suffer from intense heat near the equator, and by mid-April, the North Star was lost below the horizon. The Southern Cross, now a familiar celestial landmark, was once again seen. As they made their way, the weather became colder as they approached the dangerous high-pressure zone of the South Atlantic. It was here in late April and throughout May that the main fleet encountered a host of storms which scattered the 15 ships. Estevang de Gama, coming in two months later, would also be hit by a massive storm near the tip of Africa. Miraculously, all 20 ships would survive rounding the Cape of Good Hope and would make it to the Indian Ocean. Once Vasco de Gama and his 15 ships arrived and regrouped off the eastern coast of Africa at a predetermined rally point, the decision was made to move on to Sofala. Sofala was believed to be the biblical port of Ophir, a wealthy city renowned as the location of King Solomon's mines, and perhaps even the capital city for the Queen of Sheba. The city sat on an island at the delta of the Buzi River where the gold trade of eastern Africa funneled its way down. The Armada would arrive on June 10th. Vasco, who had been informed of the significance of the city, immediately surveyed the land for an ideal spot for a fortress. He then sent his men in to begin trading. 
Over the next two weeks, the Portuguese would haul in a massive amount of gold in exchange for simple glass beads, woolen apparel, and other minor goods. Having his ships put their cannons on display seemed to have significantly swayed the exchange rate. The Armada sailed on to Mozambique, a place that Vasco had shelled during his last visit. Now with nearly four times the ships and perhaps ten times the firepower, the Sultan was all about cooperation. More gold was brought on board before Vasco sailed on. On July 12th, he arrived at Kilwa. The city may have hit its golden age more than a century before, but it was still rich and wealthy from both the gold and ivory trade. However, the Sultan had given the prior Portuguese commander, Pedro Cabral, a cold reception and had gone so far as to deny Vasco an audience claiming that he was sick. The Portuguese admiral didn't buy it and had no patience for diplomacy. He sailed right into the harbor at full speed. Along the way, he ordered a fleet-wide cannonade to announce his presence before pulling up right in front of the Sultan's waterside palace and targeting it with everything he had. The chronicler Gaspar Cohea recounted his response, quote, I am the slave of the king, my sovereign. All the men whom you see here and who are in that fleet will do that which I command, and know for certain that if I choose in one single hour, your city will be reduced to embers, and if I choose to kill your people, they will all be burned in that fire." End quote. The Sultan suddenly emerged, and Vasco simply gave him a to-do list. Gama demanded that the Portuguese would now have the rights to trade in gold, ivory, and spice under very favorable conditions. Kilwa would henceforth be a vassal and was now required to pay the King of Portugal a hefty annual tribute for protection. And the Sultan was now required to fly the Portuguese flag from the tallest tower of his palace. With Kilwa brought down a notch, the Armada made its way and arrived at friendly Malindi on July 27th. With a line of ships stretching to the horizon, Malindi was now friendlier. Two days later on July 29th, with the winds of the monsoon building to crescendo, Vasco da Gama turned his ships to the east and plunged into the Indian Ocean. Roger Crowley in the book The Conquerors recounts his voyage, quote, the crossing of the Indian Ocean was comparatively uneventful. By August 20th, 1502, the whole fleet was at the Angediva Islands. Along the way, they raided the ports of Anovar and Batkal without any apparent justification. Gama bluntly declared to their cowering Raja, in the words of the chronicler Cohea, This is the fleet to the King of Portugal, my sovereign, who is the lord of the sea, the world, and also of you. From here, the Armada moved further south, and by early September, it was at Mount Delhi, a prominent headland backed by sheltering lagoons north of Kanur. This was the first and last port of call for merchant ships trading along the Malabar coast. The crest of Mount Delhi, 900 feet above sea level, provided a wide lookout point from which to plan a maritime ambush. On September 29, 1502, that chance came. A large dhow was sighted coming from the north. Gama immediately put out to sea with a detachment of ships. His cannons were primed. End quote. The ship was the Miri, a large dhow loaded with pilgrims returning from Mecca. Vasco's fleet quickly surrounded it, and the Miri immediately surrendered. The local merchants were confident that they could negotiate, that is, bribe, their way out of the situation. This was, after all, a common practice on the Indian Ocean where bribing the local pirates was just business as usual. Money would exchange hands, often there'd be a handshake and people would be on their way. Thus, the merchants on the Miri made one offer after another, each bid increasing in value. But negotiation gave way to desperation, as Gamma accepted none of it. Instead, the Admiral demanded everything on the ship be handed over. Tomé Lopez, one of Vasco's men who watched and recorded the event, stated that the merchants gave what they wanted without torture. Apparently, it wasn't enough. Gamma was angry. In his first voyage, he had come as an explorer. Now, he came as a crusader. In his eyes, he was engaged in a holy war. The ship was stripped of its rudder and its tackle, and by some accounts, its masts were disabled. 
Then it was towed out far into the ocean. The people on board began to beg for their lives, and it became clear what would happen next. The Portuguese boarded the ship and rigged it to burn with everyone on board. The fires were lit, and the engineers returned to their longboats. Roger Crowley explained what happened next. Quote, now understanding the seriousness of their plight, those aboard the Miri responded with spirit. They somehow extinguished the fires and sought out whatever missiles, arms, and stones they could find. They decided to go down fighting. When the longboats returned to reignite the fires, they were met with a hail of missiles hurled by both men and women. They were forced to back off. They attempted to pummel the disabled ship with their gunfire, but the longboats carried cannons too light to inflict serious damage. Even from a distance, they could see the women pleading for their lives, holding out jewelry and precious objects, begging the admiral for mercy. Some even took their little children and held them out. We understood that what they asked for was simply pity, wrote Tome Lopez, whose account became increasingly more distraught. Gama watched all of this impassively, hidden from sight behind a spy hole. He made no response. On the ship, the passengers started to construct barricades out of mattresses, hurdles, anything they could find. They were determined that they would sell their lives at the highest price. For five days, the disabled Miri floated on the hot sea. The ship on which Lopez sailed followed it closely. On the fifth day, they were ordered to finish it off. We could see everything, wrote Tome Lopez. It was Monday, October 3rd a date I will remember as long as I live." End quote. It was at this point that a single Portuguese ship came alongside the Miri and grappled it. Suddenly, the Muslims sprung into action. They took the ropes and pulled the Portuguese vessel closer. As the Miri was a taller ship, those on board rained down a hail of stones, rocks, whatever they could find. The Portuguese sailors were staggered by the attack. Soon after, the Muslims jumped down and began to board the Portuguese vessel. Nigel Cliff in The Last Crusade described the ferocity of the attack. Quote, The battle showed no signs of letting up. The Muslims fought with such vehemence that it was marvelous to see, and even though we wounded and killed many, it seemed as if no one was dying and no one felt their wounds. They tore arrows from their skin, flung them back at the attackers, and threw themselves back in the action without a second's pause. They then threw themselves at the stern castle with the superhuman force of men who knew that they were wronged. The victims were now the Avengers." End quote. During this entire time, the wind had died down. The rest of the armada could not move in to help. But then, one of the Portuguese ships managed to find a breeze and sailed in. It came in alongside the Miri, feigning an attempt to board it. The Muslim attackers, now seeing this new threat, withdrew to their ship to defend it to the last. It would prove to be a mistake. Lopes' vessel was able to cut the grapple lines and withdrew. With the wind picking up, the rest of the armada sailed in. The fate of the Miri was now sealed. Tome Lopes would lament. After all those battles, the admiral ordered the ship burned with all the men and women who were on it. This was to be done very cruelly and without the slightest bit of pity. Screams rent the air. Some of the Muslims leapt into the water with hatchets in their hands and swam to the nearest boats, but they were harpooned in the water as they tried to hack at the bottoms of our ships. Almost all the rest, nearly 300 men and women, either burned or were drowned. It was said that before the Miri went down, 20 children were rescued and baptized. Gama would later recount that he had saved their souls. However, all along the Malabar coast, what happened to the Miri would never be forgiven or forgotten. Centuries later, it is still remembered. As the Spanish proverb goes, La sombra de grandes pecados es muy alargada, meaning the shadow of great sins is very long. Vasco de Gama, Admiral of India, Portuguese crusader, had finally made the entrance that he wanted. But in the grand scheme of things, he was only getting warmed up.
The Armada now made its way to the city of Kanur and took up position in its harbor on October 18th. This was a friendly port that already had a small Portuguese presence. The Colatiri, the Raja of Kanur, greeted Vasco with his royal entourage. He was flanked by over 400 of his elite Nayar warriors. The Admiral refused to set foot on land as he vowed not to touch Indian soil until he had dealt properly with Calicut. Here, royal gifts were exchanged and a new formal treaty was established, but it was not a smooth process. Vasco was easily angered with any deviation from his demands, which included favorable prices on spice, the establishment of a Portuguese factory in the city, and the initiation of the Cartaz system. The latter was a system of licensing. From that period onwards, all ships conducting trade had to have proper paperwork or else be subject to attack that is, Portuguese attack. With favorable negotiations completed, it was now time to move on to Calicut. The Admiral and his ships arrived before the great city on October 29th. The Samudri Raja, also known as the Zamorin, by now had heard of this massive incoming fleet and no doubt of the incident with the Miri. Days before, the ruler of Calicut had composed a diplomatic letter to Vasco da Gama, Crowley elaborates, quote, The Samudri Raja wrote a letter to Gama while he was still in Kanur in an attempt to establish peace. He wished the Christians nothing but friendship. However, he had written a rather different letter to his rebellious vassal, the Raja of Cochin. In it, he stressed the need for cooperation and gave a crystal clear analysis of their joint situation. There remained only one sure solution. If they did not adopt it, they would all be lost and conquered. He proposed that the whole of the Malabar coast should shut their ports and offer no more spice to the Europeans. Unfortunately, the king of Cochin remained defiant, and it was these cracks in the local politics that would ultimately doom them all. He replied that he was at peace with the Portuguese and had no intention of acting otherwise. Furthermore, he showed the letter to the Portuguese that were living in his city, who passed it on to Gama. The admiral was thus in receipt of both letters as he sailed into Calicut. End quote. As the armada took a position in the harbor, a Brahmin, that is a man of the highest caste, approached dressed as a Franciscan friar. He'd been sent by the Samudri Raja to begin talks, but the admiral's response was fierce. Vasco demanded that the Portuguese were to be unhindered in trade, that all spices would have to have an advantageous price, and that all Muslims needed to be expelled immediately. The next day, the Samudri acquiesced to all of Vasco's demands, except for the expulsion of the Muslims. The king of Calicut explained that they were a vital part of commerce for his city, which he emphasized was still an open port. What's more, the Muslims had been there for generations. Simply getting rid of them was not something that he was capable of doing. This response angered the admiral. He immediately captured about 40 fishermen who were coming into the harbor and held them as hostages. The Zamorin, in turn, was not pleased with this action, and tensions grew. On the night of October 31st, Vasco sent a strongly worded response, saying that if all of his demands were not met, at high noon the next day, his ships would fire on the city. That night, the Portuguese scouted the harbor looking for the best firing positions, while the warriors of Calicut began digging trenches, reinforcing them with wooden barricades and positioning their own cannon to fire back. Nigel Cliff in The Last Crusade explained what followed the next day, quote, Noon on November 1st, the appointed day, passed with no reply. The admiral made his move. On his command, boats went around the fleet distributing the Muslim captives. One hour after midday, the prisoners' necks were placed in nooses and the ends of the ropes were thrown over the yards. The struggling men were hoisted to the top and were hung in full sight of the city, 34 bodies quivering to a standstill. On the shore, the swelling crowd watched in horror. Then the rest of the ships opened fire and the Indians were forced to flee. The Europeans shouted mocking taunts as they ran away. The men in the sand bunkers attempted to fire back, but they only had a few old bombards and their aim was wide off the mark. Eventually, they too had to run for their lives. 
The massive bombardment of the city then started in earnest. Cannonballs thundered overhead and smashed into the earthworks and thatched roofs of the houses near the shore. Decapitated palm trees splintered, groaned, and toppled, showering everything around with deadly shrapnel. Many men, women, and children were killed instantly, and thousands fled. Gama decided then and there that the shelling of the city would continue for the rest of the day. End quote. Despite all of this carnage and destruction, the Admiral was not satisfied. The next day, the assault began again. But now instead of the homes that bordered the water, the larger homes and palaces set further inland were targeted. Again, one massive volley followed by another pummeled the city. Fires broke out and the people had to run for their lives. It was only darkness that brought an end to the destruction. Vasco, however, was in a bit of a predicament. He knew that he could not capture the city by landing troops. He'd be too greatly outnumbered. For now, he would have to settle for simply mastery of the sea. His hope was that the destruction that he ordered would bring the Samudri to terms. In that sense, he was right. The effect of this attack was being felt everywhere. Trade along the entire Malabar coast had ground to a halt. On November 3rd, the Armada departed to the south. Vicente Sodre and his squadron were ordered to patrol Calicut and blockade all shipping. Clearly, the Portuguese presence in the Indian Ocean now had the manpower to accomplish multiple objectives. To the south, Cochin was an excellent harbor built on a small peninsula of land that was surrounded by lagoons and waterways. Its Raja was a devoted ally of the Portuguese, though the trust and faith he placed in the Europeans was never fully returned in kind. For Vasco da Gama, this was a very productive stop. He immediately got to work filling his ships with spice. Delegates from Kanor arrived advocating their support and an eagerness to continue trade. What's more, the queen of the neighboring city of Kolam sent in an envoy proposing the same thing. It was during this exchange with the embassy of Kolam that the Portuguese learned of a Christian community further to the south. It was said that the apostle St. Thomas had traveled to India and there had established a church. Now there were approximately 30,000 followers. Granted, there were a sect that followed the teachings of Nestorianism, making them all, well, heretics. But it was a start and they were willing to pledge their loyalty to the king of Portugal. Vasco also learned of Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka, which was described as a rich island 300 leagues long with great mountains and an abundance of precious stones, pearls, and spice. This was quickly added to the map to be looked into later. Early 1503 saw things going definitively in the Admiral's favor. His armada was fully loaded with spice, his patrolling squadrons were having a field day raiding the local shipping, and the cities of the Malabar coast were now competing for Portugal's favor, most advocating for the Portuguese to build a fortress in their area. Vasco da Gama knew that his bombardment of Calicut had a major effect. What's more, Vicente Sodre's blockade had reduced the city to near starvation, making it an example for anyone who would defy the Portuguese. Thus, it wasn't that surprising when the Samudri of Calicut sent in one of his esteemed Brahmin priests, heavily laden with gifts and jewels, as an envoy to renew talks. Skeptical at first, the Admiral was eventually convinced to go back. He decided to take command of Estevang de Gama's ship, the Flor de la Mar, and with the addition of just one other small caravel, he sailed to Calicut to hear what its king would offer. After three days of traveling, Gama arrived at Calicut again. The Brahmin was sent into the city, but didn't return. Instead, another man arrived and asked if the Admiral could send a man of high stature into the city to complete the negotiations. Vasco knew that something was off, his anger exploded, and this request was denied. The Zamoran sent back another message stating that as it was late, perhaps it would be best for all to get some rest and renew discussions in the morning. The Admiral agreed, albeit he didn't really have much of a choice. The winds were calm and there wasn't enough light to safely navigate out of the harbor. Fearing sabotage, Vasco ordered his men to secure his ship in place with a very strong metal line. Just before dawn on the next day, lookouts on the Flor de la Mar spotted a strange ship headed right towards them. 
It turned out to be two ships that were tied together. Vasco reasoned that this might be the Zamorans' delegation, but then more ships began to appear. They were small, agile fishing vessels, and all of them were moving at rapid speed toward them. The Portuguese men began to count them. First it was 20, then 40, then 80, and it became clear that there were soldiers on board. Suddenly, a nearby ship was set on fire by its crew. Its anchor line was cut, and the now fire barge was pushed in their direction. At the same time, the fast-moving fishing vessels had closed a considerable distance. They then revealed their hidden cargo. On board were small cannons. The early morning peace was shattered as the crews opened up. Cannonballs skimmed over the water and gouged holes in the hull of the Flora de la Mar. Vasco da Gama realized he was now outnumbered, outgunned, about to be engulfed in flame, and with the metal chain anchoring his ship, he was stuck in the water. His anger grew exponentially as it dawned on him that he had fallen right into the Zamorans' trap. The Flor de la Mar was a 400-ton carrack and the pride of the 4th Portuguese Armada. She was the biggest ship that Portugal had ever built thus far. On her maiden voyage, she had made it all the way to India, captained by Estevang de Gama. She was now under the command of Estevang's relative, the Admiral Vasco de Gama. Vasco da Gama had come back to India to assert his king's dominance over trade in the Indian Ocean. In doing so, he had left a path of carnage and destruction in his wake. But now, his luck had run dry. The Zamorin, the Samudri Raja of Calicut, had caught him in a trap. The Raja had managed to lure the Admiral into the harbor of the great trading city under the premise of negotiating a treaty. But this time around, there was going to be absolutely no discussions. Early the next morning, Vasco found himself surrounded, outnumbered, and under attack by a large fleet of ships. Even a nearby vessel had been set ablaze, and the now fire barge was released in Gamma's direction. To make matters even worse, the night before, the Admiral had ordered his men to secure the ship in place using a heavy metal chain, which now, of course, prevented him from escaping. Gamma had most of his men take cover below deck. His first priority was to break the chain and get underway. But the Raja's men kept up a massive volley of arrow and cannon fire, killing and wounding many of the Portuguese sailors who attempted to cut the anchor line. Meanwhile, the fire barge moved ever closer, threatening to bring the Flor de la Mar to a fiery demise. Indeed, as they came in, the scene looked very bleak. The deck was already strewn with the dead and the dying. Vasco himself had also been wounded several times. The end for him seemed like it was quickly approaching. Miraculously, the water current of the harbor suddenly shifted. The fire barge began to drift off, only missing the Portuguese vessel by a narrow margin. Instead, it moved off towards the Raja's ships, which had to swerve to miss it. Many of them were forced to break off their attack. Gama's men finally managed to break the chain and get underway, but just as they were starting to move, the wind died and once again the massive ship was stuck. Desperate Portuguese gunners brought their broadsides to bear, but at such short range, they were mostly ineffective. However, the sound of gunfire could be heard for miles around. It was unmistakable for all those who heard it. Just as fate would have it, that gunfire was indeed heard. Vicente Sodre, Gama's uncle and vice admiral, just happened to be inbound from Canor that morning with his entire flotilla. The sound of Portuguese cannons going off instantly brought them to full alert. Sails were fully unfurled and the fleet sailed in at ramming speed. When the wind faded, oars were frantically deployed and in record time, Sodre was in range to attack. His fleet came alongside and opened up on the Raja's men. Portuguese gunners at this point were highly skilled and their accuracy was deadly. With the big guns unloading upon them, the sailors of Calicut were caught completely off guard. Their ships were pummeled and eventually they had to scatter and flee. Vicente Sodre then pulled up to Gama's ship to render assistance and provide protection. The Admiral at this point was furious. Now, instead of departing immediately, he had his ships parade back and forth in the harbor as a show of force. 
That night, Vasco had his men gather together the Indian bodies of those that were killed in the attack. He ordered the corpses to be placed in a large pile on a barge. The ghastly vessel was then driven ashore with a note for the Samudri Raja. It read, Vile man, you had me called for and I came in answer to your call. You did as much as you could and if you could have, you would have done more. The punishment will be as you deserve. When I come back here, I will make you pay what you owe and it will not be in cash. Leaving Calicut behind, the fleet made its way first to Kanor for repairs, where Vasco da Gama had a chance to take in the strategic situation. He knew that if the Portuguese endeavor in India was to be successful, it would need to hold dominance not just on the sea, but also on the land. With that, the admiral ordered the armada back to Cochin, where a meeting was arranged with the Trimompara Raja. Nigel Cliff in The Last Crusade surmised the proceedings, quote, the running battle with Calicut was threatening to capsize the entire mission, but once again Vasco da Gama found a safe haven in Cochin. The fleet regrouped, the sailors swapped stories, and the admiral met twice more with the king. Their final agreement established a permanent Portuguese factory in the city. What's more, in a somewhat surprising sleight of hand, the admiral was given jurisdiction over all the Portuguese in Cochin, and by proxy, all the Christians in India. This was no mere trade treaty. It established Europe's first Indian colony, and in theory at least, it made all of India's Christians subjects of the Portuguese crown." End quote. This Portuguese colony in Cochin, by the way, was going to be more than just a simple trading outpost. At the mouth of the main harbor, a fortress was to be constructed. Cochin was not going to be just an ally, but a fully operational battle station. On February 10th, 1503, Vasco completed his negotiations. By now, his ships were fully laden down with spice, and as the monsoons were shifting, it was clear it was time to head home. However, as preparations for the return journey were being made, word arrived that the Samudri Raja of Calicut had assembled a massive war fleet. The Samudri had spared no expense, he had purchased every cannon he could buy, hired a bunch of skilled sailors, and had even gone so far as to employ the service of Arabian privateers from the Red Sea. The Raja's fleet was massive, it consisted of 20 larger ships, flanked by 40 large dows known as sandbucks, and an additional 100 smaller support vessels. On hearing this news, Gama assembled his war cabinet, and along with his vice admiral, Vicente Sodre, it was decided to seize the initiative and launch an attack. The armada set sail immediately. Two days later, they spotted the enemy fleet inbound from the north near the coast, a few miles from Calicut. Before the Raja's ships had time to assemble, Gama had his armada form up in a long straight line, thus bringing all of their broadsides to bear, which, perhaps in recorded history, was one of the first times this naval tactic was employed against another fleet. His men got lucky, they scored several direct hits, in doing so they annihilated the entire leading wave of incoming vessels. The Arab privateers took the bulk of the damage. Many were sunk or put on a commission before they could even return fire. Despite this, the faster moving sandbooks were sent in with the hope that their speed could outmaneuver cannon fire and close the distance to board the slower moving Portuguese ships. Nigel Cliff explains, quote, a new cry went up on the Portuguese ships. A swarm of sandbooks and long rowboats were heading toward them from the city, all armed and with their guns already firing. Gama's men scrambled to return fire, but the boats kept on coming. The Indians had learned to push on until they were past the range of European guns. That way they could put their numerical advantage to use in hand-to-hand -hand fighting." End quote. Vasco moved decisively to counter this new threat. He ordered his slower-moving spice ships and caracks to sail onto the north, providing long-distance fire support as they went. At the same time, he had Vicente Sodre take command of the faster caravels and use them to draw off the sandbooks. The intercepting maneuvers stopped the sandbooks in their tracks. They were now sitting ducks for the Portuguese line of fire. At this point, the Raja's fleet had taken on way too much damage. Morale faltered and his ships broke and retreated in full route to the city. But this was not going to prove to be a safe haven. A sudden gust of wind gave the Portuguese armada the speed it needed to sail in, which it took full advantage of. 
Then, at near point-blank range, the ships of the Samudri and his allies were hunted down. Some of the ships were destroyed outright, others were grappled and captured, the rest were set on fire. Surprisingly enough, Vasco didn't order the city to be bombarded again. Perhaps he knew that his old rival had already suffered enough embarrassment. Or perhaps, more importantly, it dawned on him that attacking the city would not bring the Samudri to terms. Either way, that day Gama knew he had won for Portugal a stunning victory, but he also knew that the Raja of Calicut was not going to give up easily. It became clear to both sides that this was going to be an all-out war. With the Samudri's fleet and his reputation left in ruins, the 4th Portuguese Armada made its way north to Canor. They were heavily laden down with spice and had limited time before the coming of the monsoon winds. In Canor, the Admiral met again with the Colatiri Raja, who was more than willing now to accept Portugal as an ally. Word of Gama's stunning victory, after all, had spread along the entire Malabar coast, bringing many of the city-states towards the Portuguese side. Like in Cochin, a permanent Portuguese settlement was also established in Canor. But for Gama, this wasn't enough. Roger Crowley in the book The Conquerors explains, quote, The Portuguese now started to introduce a toll system for shipping along the shores of the Malabar coast. They issued safe conduct passes called cartazes that ensured protection for the vessels of friendly powers. This was effectively a tax on commerce. In time, it would require merchant shipping to trade in Portuguese-controlled ports and additionally pay substantial import and export duties. This marked a radical shift in the Indian Ocean. With the coming of the Europeans, the sea was no longer a free trade zone. The Cartaz system introduced the alien concept of territorial waters, a politicized space controlled by armed force and the Portuguese ambition to dominate the sea. End quote. It was on February 22, 1503, that the Admiral of India laid in a course for home and departed. His second great voyage to the east was coming to an end. However, as he left, Vasco da Gama was very worried. The fact that the Samudri of Calicut was able to raise a decent navy meant that the sea would be contested. Furthermore, the Admiral knew that if Portugal was to be successful, it would also need to dominate the land. Thus, a system of fortresses would be absolutely critical. Taking in the strategic situation once again, the Admiral formulated what needed to be done till more Portuguese forces could arrive. Vasco ordered his uncles, Vicente Sodre and Brash Sodre, to remain behind with their ships. This was to be the first permanent Portuguese naval presence in the Indian Ocean. Vicente and Brash were given multiple objectives. First, they were to blockade Calicut in order to cripple it economically and starve the city into submission, something that they did, by the way, very well. Second, they were also to travel to the city of Aden at the mouth of the Red Sea with the intent to bottle up Arab shipping, which was an extremely strategic move and, mark my words, would have serious repercussions. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, they were to defend the fortress that was being built in Cochin. Vasco da Gama and King Manuel knew that this was the key for all future endeavors. Portugal's lifeblood would hinge on fortresses like this, something that the Admiral, by the way, emphasized to the two brothers before he left. To their credit, Vicente and his brother Brash initially did what they were told. But then, the allure of Arab shipping coming out of the Red Sea became just too tempting. Their greed overcame their strategic insight, and for that matter, what they were ordered to do. Despite the desperate pleas of its Raja to remain and provide protection, both Sodres decided instead to abandon Cochin. Leaving only a handful of Portuguese behind, the two sailed off to get richer. Vicente and Brash made their way to Aden. There, they raided and plundered and killed anything they could find. Arab ships proved easy targets for these experienced captains. But then, Mother Nature intervened. Near the Red Sea, both men were caught in a storm and were shipwrecked. It was said that Vicente drowned immediately, and that Brash, who was despised by his men, was killed in a mutiny that followed. The Portuguese initiative in the Indian Ocean had now been seriously compromised, not to mention that Cochin was now nearly defenseless.
The news of Vasco da Gama's, and more importantly, his armada's departure, along with the death of the Sodres, made its way back to the Samudri Raja of Calicut. This was music to his ears. Roger Crowley gives us the tale. Quote, With the Sodres' departure, the Samudri Raja acted promptly. He created and then advanced with a large army towards Cochin. Along the way, he dispatched a letter to its king, pointing out the evil consequences of offering a place to the Christians, from whom he had received so much harm. And he demanded that the king of Cochin hand them over. Otherwise, the Samudri Raja was determined to enter Cochin, destroy it, and seize the Christians with all their things. This thunderous message was met with outright refusal. The king of Cochin had decided to throw in his lot with the Christians. He would live or die by his decision. End quote. By some estimates, the Samudri Raja had 50,000 men on the march. He had created this vast army by combining his forces with that of all of his other vassals. In a sense, he was all in. The Portuguese, on the other hand, had a few hundred, along with perhaps 8,000 Nayar warriors of Cochin, who, by the way, were not exactly thrilled to fight for Europeans. Now, if the Samudri was able to capture the city, destroy the Portuguese fortress and outpost, and apprehend, and most likely then execute, the men of Portugal who were stationed there, it would prove absolutely disastrous for the entire Portuguese cause. Make no mistake, this was a game changer. Thus, with such a massive army advancing on the city, it was clear that the Portuguese presence was now hanging on by its fingernails. Yet, in this dark hour, Portugal had a commander who rose up to answer the call to defend the city. However, with such long odds, this general would still need a miracle if he, his men, and his country's position were to survive. That all said, whether he was ready for it or not, the battle for Cochin had begun. The Trimampara Raja, the king of Cochin, was a man who had many troubles. His throne was never secure, and it wasn't just the political factions that surrounded him, but members of his own family who were based in the nearby town of Edipali that were all maneuvering to seize his crown. To make matters even worse, he was a vassal to the Samudri Raja of Calicut, whose rule extended over many of the cities of the Malabar coast, including Cochin. Thus, the ruler of Cochin needed something, anything, to stay on top. Opportunity would soon present itself. When the Portuguese had arrived in the Indian Ocean, it wasn't long before war had broken out with Calicut. The Europeans had dealt the Samudri Raja one defeat after another. They had bombarded the city several times, and they had even destroyed the Calicut fleet. As a result, many of the city-states of the Malabar coast rose up in defiance. Cochin was among them. The Trimampara Raja, again the king of Cochin, had welcomed in the Portuguese with open arms. He allowed them to continue their trade in spice, thus made them extremely wealthy, and allowed them to build a fortress in his city. But now matters had taken a dramatic change for the worse. The king of Cochin now looked out at his city. It was still rebuilding. It was not that long ago that it had been burned to the ground. In February of 1503, Vasco da Gama, the Admiral of India, had left the Indian Ocean with his armada. He had left behind a flotilla of ships to guard Cochin, but those captains had abandoned their post in search of plunder on the Red Sea and were subsequently destroyed. By April of that year, the Samudri Raja, also known as the Zamoran, had sensed their weakness. He raised a massive army of 50,000 warriors in Calicut and had marched on Cochin. The Trimampara Raja had at best 5,500 warriors, whom he placed under the command of his heir, Prince Narayan. The warrior prince had marched out and at the town of Edapali he put up a stout defense at the ford of a river. Though outnumbered nearly 10 to 1, Narayan was able to hold off two direct assaults. Roger Crowley in the book Conquerors brings justice to this valiant stand. Quote, 
After having some initial military success, the Samudri Raja bribed the prince's men into disaffection, and Narayan was killed. The territory of Cochin was eventually overrun, but according to the laws of the Hindu military caste, the 200 surviving members of the prince's army swore themselves to ritual death. They shaved off all their hair and advanced towards Calicut, killing everyone they met until they had been hacked down to the last man. This sacrifice bought the king and the Portuguese time. They retreated from Cochin to the offshore island of Vaipin. The Samudri Raja of Calicut thus entered Cochin and burned the city to embers, but he wasn't able to reach the island of Vaipin as the monsoon weather had set in. The Samudri fell back to Calicut as rain and rough seas started to batter the Malabar coast. However, he swore to return in August and destroy all those who resisted him." End quote. In late August of 1503, the Zamorin returned, but as he prepared to lay siege to the island of Vaipin, his scouts reported the arrival of an incoming force. Two well-armed ships had just entered the harbor of Cochin. They were under the command of Francisco de Albuquerque, a military man with a very short temper. A few days later, another four ships would also arrive. This new flotilla just happened to be under the command of Francisco's cousin. His name was Afonso de Albuquerque. This man possessed a natural flair for combat and his confidence was justified. He was dedicated to warfare. In his nearly five decades of life, he had fought the Arabs in North Africa, the Ottomans in Italy, and the Castilians in Portugal. Afonso was destined to also make a name for himself in the Indian Ocean. In time, he would become one of the most impressive military commanders in history. These six ships were a contingent of the 5th Portuguese Armada. Their presence was immediately felt. The Zamorin, the Samudri Raja, dismantled his siege and withdrew his army. He decided to hold off hostilities till early the next year where he predicted correctly that the Portuguese Armada would once again have to leave. Make no mistake, the Samudri was definitely going to be back, and this time with greater numbers. Francisco de Albuquerque immediately took the credit for, quote, routing the army of Calicut. However, all the Portuguese commanders knew that Cochin was by no means out of danger. They had to move fast. A punitive raid was launched in the Vembanad Lagoon. Villages that had helped the Zamorin were attacked and destroyed. The city of Etapali, where the rival family members of the king of Cochin lived, was brutally razed to the ground and many of those rivals were put to death. The Portuguese, after all, were not going to take any chances with someone else coming to power in Cochin. In record time, Fort Santiago, later named Fort Manuel, was built at the mouth of the harbor. Inside of the fort, the Portuguese built their first church in India named Sao Bartholomew. Their message was clear. The Europeans were here to stay. Afonso de Albuquerque, meanwhile, led negotiations with the Queen Regent of the city of Colom, where spices were purchased and another Portuguese factory was to be built. However, the monsoon winds were shifting and the time to leave was quickly approaching. In late January of 1504, the 5th Portuguese Armada departed for home. Its journey would be ill-fated. Francisco de Albuquerque hit rough weather in the Mozambique Channel and was never heard from again. Of the 10 ships that had been part of the Armada, only five made it back to Portugal. And those that did, including the one carrying Afonso de Albuquerque, only barely made it. However, before Afonso left, he made a decision that would forever shape the Portuguese fortune in India. Afonso had placed one of his most skilled and articulate captains in charge of the defense of Cochin. That man's name was Duarte Pacheco Pereira. Duarte Pacheco Pereira was born in Lisbon in the year 1460. He was the embodiment of a Renaissance man. He was intelligent, well-educated, inquisitive, and perfectly at home on the battlefield. The great poet Luiz de Camões would describe him as the Portuguese Achilles in the epic poem Luzeadas, where he was described as having a pen in one hand and a sword in the other. Duarte seemed to have been involved everywhere in the early Portuguese Empire. 
1475, he graduated with a formal education and would go on to become the King of Portugal's personal squire, where he would become extremely well acquainted with the intrigue of the court. Later, he would be involved in various expeditions along the coast of West Africa. When he got shipwrecked in one of his journeys, he was picked up and saved by Bartholomew Diaz on his famous return from the Cape of Good Hope. In 1494, Duarte was also involved in the critical Treaty of Tordesillas, which divided the world between the Spanish and the Portuguese. In 1488, it was even hinted that he might have been the first European to have discovered the coast of South America, two years prior to the celebrated time of Cabral in 1500. He was an avid learner who wrote books on exploration, studied the interaction of primates, calculated the arc meridian to its most accurate degree and was one of the first Europeans to scientifically understand the relationship between the moon and the tides. Indeed, the mathematical models he formulated were able to predict the rhythm of the tides better than anyone had ever done before. This last bit of knowledge, by the way, would one day, strangely enough, save his life. In early 1504, the Samudri of Calicut was busy at the work of logistics. He had called in reinforcements from across his domain to gather an army of 60,000 men. By some estimates, it was as high as 87,000. He had expanded his fleet to 260 ships, albeit many were relatively minor and somewhat fragile vessels, but they did have guns. From the Ottomans, the Samudri purchased over 300 smaller cannons, though they were a bit obsolete. The Venetians, meanwhile, had secretly dispatched two agents that had technical knowledge which allowed the King of Calicut to forge five larger cannons. These Venetian guns, by the way, were powerful enough to destroy Portuguese ships. The Portuguese, on the other hand, had 150 men, along with three ships, two caravels and one carac. The Trimampara Raja rallied his army and sent out a plea for mercenaries. He was hoping for 30,000 recruits, only 8,000 showed up, but many deserted, leaving about 5,000 Nayar warriors in the end. Duarte Pereira had been well informed of what his opponent was doing. During the course of the entire battle, the Portuguese commander's intelligence service was exceptional. It revealed his enemy's movements, composition, supply chains, everything down to the five Venetian cannons that the Samudri had made. Pereira first made it a point to bolster morale. He wanted everyone to know that the Portuguese were here to defend the city to the last. He stockpiled food, surveyed the land for the most defensible locations, and had his men build wooden stockades. He kept the population at Cochin from abandoning the city. Instead, he got them to work creating extra cannonballs from stone. He also had the people carve 12 foot long spears, thousands of them. Duarte then created large wooden shields for his ships. Each were covered with mats of cotton. Thus, his ships would be protected from small cannon fire. He then began to deploy his men. 39 men in the Karak were positioned at Fort Manuel. Some of the men were placed in the city of Cochin, and the rest were deployed along the lagoon at various strategic crossing points. In these narrow fords and crossing points, the wooden spears were drilled into the lake bed at various depths. Some were embedded very deep to slow a person's movement across the shallow water, whereas other spears were positioned at a level that they would skewer a man alive if he fell on them. The 5,000 Nayar warriors at Cochin were also positioned alongside the Portuguese men. Now all that was left was to await the arrival of the Samudri and his army. On March 31, 1504, the Zamorin of Calicut arrived. He moved in on the fort of Cumbalam with the intent to cross the lagoon and advance on the city. Here, Pereira decided to make his stand, but this sudden appearance of over 60,000 warriors at Calicut shattered his men's morale. Many fled, leaving only 90 Portuguese and a few hundred Nayar. Duarte immediately deployed all three of his ships to the ford. The Samudri Raja countered this by bringing up his big Venetian cannons. Pereira quickly responded to this new threat. He had his men keep up a sporadic fire on the cannons, which in turn dispersed their crews. The three ships then quickly turned around and began to fire on anyone who attempted to cross the ford of Kambalam. The Raja, in turn, ordered a portion of his Calicut fleet to attack. 
over 150 ships moved in. But it was low tide, so only a handful could make it through the shallow waters of the lagoon at a time. The Portuguese sailors brought their guns to bear and began to pick them off in piecemeal. When the Indians attempted to return fire with their smaller cannons, the cannonballs simply bounced off the padded wooden shields. That day, wave after wave after wave of naval attack was sent in. All of them failed as the Calicut death toll soared. The carnage became so bad that even the wreckage of the Indian ships became an obstacle. Without this much needed naval support, the Samudri would not dare have his men cross the Cumbalam Ford. By midday, he called off the attack. It was a humiliating beginning for the King of Calicut, at least 30 ships destroyed and 1,500 casualties. But the Raja was by no means done. On April 7th, a week later, the Samudri Raja attacked again. His plan this time was a two-pronged assault. The first portion was a diversionary naval attack on the city. If the Portuguese raced to secure Cochin, they would leave the Pass of Cumbalam open, at which time the Raja of Calicut could cross with his men and attack. Of course, it wasn't long before Duarte Pereira knew of this strategy and planned accordingly. The Portuguese commander positioned his stronger Carrack at the mouth of the harbor and left his two faster caravels at the Cumbalam Ford. The Carrack was soon fighting off the enemy. Pereira had his faster caravels race to assist the Carrack. When the Samudri's men saw the incoming ships, they realized that they were going to be caught in a crossfire. They brought down their sails and quickly retreated. Duarte knew that the tide was going out. At low tide, the ford of Cumbalam could be crossed. He had all three of his ships get back to it as fast as they could. The Portuguese flotilla arrived just in the nick of time and began to unleash their guns on anything that moved. The Raja's fleet was battered, and anyone attempting to cross the ford soon found themselves in a watery grave. This time, the Samudri would lose 19 ships and 300 men. Duarte wasted no time. The next day, on April 8th, he took the offensive and had his ships launch a series of attacks along the entire lagoon. At key locations, the Portuguese would make landfall to destroy the Raja's supplies and prove that his soldiers were vulnerable even in their camps. Now, while these attacks didn't do much damage, it did psychologically stun the warriors of Calicut and greatly angered the Samudri Raja, who now fiercely wanted those Portuguese ships destroyed. On April 9th, 1504, the Zamorin redeployed his Venetian guns near the city of Cochin, where the Portuguese fleet had taken anchor. The battery of guns that were placed were heavily defended with wooden ramparts, making them impervious to bombardment. The Samudri made it a point to keep his vulnerable fleet back, hoping that his cannons could finish the job. Then, with a single command from the Raja, the cannons opened up and began firing on Pereira's ships. Now, keep in mind that these guns were powerful enough to demolish the ships, and they had the range to hit them, but their crews were inexperienced and lacked the precision to hit their targets. One volley after another fell short. Duarte commanded his men to do nothing. For several hours, the Venetian guns fired without hitting anything and without taking any return fire. This confused the Samudri and his men, who came to the decision that the Portuguese must be out of ammunition. The Venetian guns were moved out of their protective positions to get a better shot, and the Calicut fleet decided to sail in to take advantage of what seemed like an obviously golden opportunity. This was precisely what Duarte Pereira was waiting for. At point-blank range, the Portuguese fleet came to life. One volley after another was unleashed, smashing the Raja ships to pieces. And when the wind turned to their favor, Duarte's men sailed up to the now-exposed Venetian guns and utterly destroyed them. A demoralized Samudri Raja was forced to retreat his forces. Once again, his casualty list was extensive. It was in late April that Duarte's spies reported that the Zamorin had taken down his camp at the Cumbalam Ford and had started to march north. At first, it seemed that the forces at Calicut were done and were retreating back to their city. But soon it became apparent that they were only maneuvering into a new position at the island of Araul. 
The Samudri Raja had regained his nerve for battle and was now ready to unleash everything he had. Duarte Pereira had previously surveyed the island of Araul in detail. It was the closest island to the peninsula that Cochin sat on, a mere 500 feet of water separated the two. In the northern part of the island was the ford of Palignar, and in the southern portion was the ford of Palerti. With only about 150 men, there was no way the Portuguese could defend both. Duarte knew that the Samudri was counting on this, but he also knew a lot about the fords. He knew that Palignar in the north was fordable on foot only at low tide, and that Palerti in the south was only fordable with ships at high tide as the ferries could not operate in shallow water. As mentioned before, the Portuguese commander had done his research on tides. He knew exactly when the low and the high tides would be. He thus planned accordingly. Two stockades were built at both passes, spikes and spears were drilled into the ford waterbeds. He also had his men prepare to move back and forth quickly along with their cannons. Before the Samudri Raja had even positioned himself on the island, Duarte had his men enter the island to cut down all the trees and vegetation so that there would be absolutely no cover. On May 1st, 1504, the Zamorin attacked in force. It was high tide, which meant the attack would come in the south at the ford of Palerti. Duarte had his men ready. His ships and shore batteries began opening fire on the Zamorin's men who were preparing to embark on their ferries. As there was no vegetation to hide it, they made easy targets. And when the Samudri's men attempted to set up their own cannons, they too were easily picked off. In fact, at certain points, the Portuguese sailors would come ashore, rush the Indian batteries, and spike the cannons to explode. The Samudri Raja's ships were once again no match for the Portuguese caravels. They were decimated by concentrated gunfire. This fighting went on for hours, and soon the tide went out. Duarte now knew it was time to shift to the northern fort of Palignar. As predicted, the Zamorin had a column of shock troops sent in, but even before they could enter the ford, they came under intense cannon fire. Those that did make it into the lagoon moved slowly. Some of these soldiers had their feet impaled on the spikes that the engineers at Cochin had drilled into the shallow waters, making them move even slower. They made little progress and took heavy casualties, but at the same time, the situation for the Portuguese and the Nayars at Cochin was becoming desperate. Many were wounded and exhausted. Supplies and ammunition were running low. It became evidently clear that the defenses that Duarte had in place were simply not enough. Now, had the Samudri Raja attacked again immediately, which he planned to do, he simply would have overwhelmed the defenders. However, that very night, gale force winds and heavy rain struck the battlefield. Nobody could move. What's worse, a massive cholera epidemic broke out in the Zamorin's camp. In the course of the coming week, cholera would claim over 10,000 men. That week gave the Portuguese time to greatly strengthen all of their defenses, larger stockades, more spikes in the water, and rest for the men. They were gonna need it. On May 7, 1504, the Zamorin launched his largest assault yet. It was divided into three contingents. 12,000 men made up the front, another 12,000 men in the second wave, and 15,000 along with engineers to hack down the stockades brought up the rear. It was low tide, so once again the crossing would have to be at the ford of Palignar. The Portuguese were estimated to have about 100 men, along with about 200 warriors of Cochin, so roughly 300. But in that narrow corridor, they were determined to make the Zamorin's numbers count for nothing. The Zamorin gave the command for his army to advance and take the opposite bank. They were immediately under Portuguese gunfire. The soldiers of Calicut waded into the water, which slowed down their progress. When they hit the embedded spikes and had their feet impaled, they went even slower. 
However, the Zamorin's military timetable had not anticipated this. The second and the third wave came up precisely when they were supposed to. With the slowed movement of that first wave forced them all together, they became compacted into one giant mass of human bodies, all slowly making their way across the water. Duarte now had all of his cannons direct their fire into this mound. The results were horrific. Cannonballs hit the mob of men, gutting open large swathes. Some incoming rounds would tear their way through five or even six lines of men. Portuguese precision was spot on. At one point, a talented gunner even fired directly at the Zamorin's tent, killing one of the king's aides right next to him. As the day progressed, the artillery was relentless, and yet the Zamorin threw even more men into the fight. Surprisingly, his men made it to the opposite bank. There, they had to overcome a stockade, but some of the defenders abandoned their positions and ran for their lives. It would seem that the Zamorin had achieved his goal. But then the tide came in and stopped all progress. The warriors of Calicut were now reduced to swimming back in the middle of cannon fire. This attack would be one of the most costly defeats the Samudri had to endure, but he knew he had come within a hair's breadth of victory. Analyzing everything that had happened, the King of Calicut now came up with one final plan to crush his enemy. Three weeks later, in late May, he had 30,000 men positioned at the ford of Palignar. At the ford of Palerti, he had his men create floating castles, essentially large lumbering rafts with towers and heavily reinforced walls. Each had the capacity to hold a large contingent of men. At high tide, he had his castles begin drifting across the water, spearheaded by fire barges. Duarte sent in his ships. They were able to evade the fire barges, but their cannons were ineffective against the strong walls of the floating fortresses. The Zamorin's men had nearly made it to the other side, and things were looking very grim for the Portuguese. Duarte was remembered as uttering the line, Lord, don't make me pay for my sins just yet. He then had all of his ships concentrate their fire on a single leading floating castle. Now, while it was not enough firepower to destroy it, it was able to undo the structural integrity of the craft. The castle literally began to come undone, and its heavy weight caused it to drag along the bottom. Eventually, it got stuck. Seeing this, the same process was repeated on the rest of the Zamoran's fleet, which slowed them down. And then, the tide went out, getting them all stuck in the mud. Duarte had his men quickly board the castles, set them on fire, and then had them escape as the tide went out. Many of the men on those floating fortresses never made it back. Meanwhile, to the north, at the ford of Palignar, with the low tide, the Zamorin's men began to cross. But by now, Pereira had his men and his ships redeployed. At the ford, they would repeat their performance in the prior assault. Once again, they would dish out massive carnage. And once again, the Zamorin's attack would fail. That day, the Zamorin had the greatest number of casualties of any assault. In the aftermath, his nerves were shattered, the morale of his men destroyed. Other assaults would be ordered over the next few days, but they would never have the same resolve or fortitude again. On June 24, 1504, the King of Calicut, now a broken man, abdicated his throne. He would pass his crown on to his nephew and heir, Prince Naubiadarim. Now with poor weather coming in and few other options, the army of Calicut retreated on July 3rd. The Battle of Cochin was over. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, the King of Portugal, Manuel I, had laid down the plans to launch the 6th Portuguese Armada. It was a powerful force, built with the assumption that Cochin and the other Malabar city-states had likely already fallen. Thus, this new armada was prepared for a massive fight. But when the ships arrived in the Indian Ocean, they were in for a shock. Roger Crowley explains, quote, The fleet that relieved Cochin in the autumn of 1504 was substantial. Fourteen Karaks, including five large and newly built ones, each carrying a substantial complement of soldiers, sailors, and great firepower. 
With news of Pereira's great victory and the Samudri's abdication resounding up and down the Malabar coast, these new arrivals made a powerful impression on the trading cities and their rulers. The word was out. The Portuguese were evidently invincible. End quote. Duarte Pacheco Pereira had saved Cochin and arguably the Portuguese Empire in India. He would return to Lisbon in 1505 to a hero's welcome. Eventually, he returned to being a Renaissance man. Pereira would write books, continue to explore, and engage in his mathematical pursuits. However, for a man who gave so much for his country, he was ironically brought down by the intrigue of the Portuguese court. He was falsely accused of corruption and theft, briefly imprisoned, eventually exonerated, but he would never regain his former fame. He would die in obscurity in 1533. Yet, his contribution was undeniable. Portugal, a small, impoverished country only a few decades back, was now on the cusp of incredible greatness. The time of discovery was over. The sea passage to India had become essentially a highway. The time of commerce, creating new trade routes and outposts, was well established. The money was flowing in. Now, the King of Portugal was about to unleash two incredibly gifted military commanders, Francisco de Almeida and Alfonso de Albuquerque. The time of conquest had begun.